Uh, you know, I started uh, thinking that uh, it was a, a, a nice, uh, let's say, uh, argument, a little bit of a change uh, in, uh, in a, a set of uh, uh, lots of technical talks. I would talk about the economics of IT, uh, in particular the economics of private and public cloud, uh, because uh, uh, we um, are surrounded by experts and people that basically are telling us one thing, that all our work and all the things that we are doing for creating private clouds, for creating hybrid clouds, according to the experts, like this one, are basically a data fort. Uh, this slide, is, uh, this uh, uh, little picture comes from uh, Simon Wardley, which is a, a very well-renowned expert in uh, uh, industry mapping and in strategy. And uh, basically, uh, the, uh, he told me that uh, the only sensible way for the future of IT is public cloud, and uh, creating a private cloud or using one is like trying to ride on a dead horse. You have the appearance of doing something, but actually you're not going anywhere. Uh, so the natural extension of this is uh, what we are talking uh, about for uh, hybrid clouds. And we do have lots of other industry experts that say that hybrid clouds are basically a way for very large companies that don't want to move to public clouds to basically say, we are still in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, please look at us, we are here to take your money, and so on. Uh, there's a problem with this. When I hear something or I read something where there is not a, a number of justification for such a claim, I usually uh, use it as a way to avoid doing real work. So uh, I cancel all my meetings and I say, I need to do some slides and I need to find a place to tell them. Uh, the first important thing is that it seems like a public cloud is some magical place somewhere else. Uh, in uh, an article uh, that was published a few days ago, just after the end of the uh, very large AVS reInvent event, one journalist say, oh, finally, we are getting rid of data centers. But actually, Amazon do have data centers. Uh, when we talk about the public cloud, we're actually using someone else's computers under a different interface, under a different contractual agreement, but exactly not a different computer. And the other interesting aspect is, if there's such a huge economic advantage, in, in one case, Simon Wardley mentioned that there was a five times advantage in using public cloud versus private one. Actually, uh, according to economic theory, in one or two years, basically no one would be using a private cloud anymore, or even traditional hardware. Everyone will be using the public cloud. As you can see, basically, this is one of the best survey in the markets. It's from 451 Group. Uh, there are people that actually go there and ask to see how much money do you want to spend in one thing or the other. And as you can see, basically 45%, half of spending is still on non-virtualized or in private internal virtual clouds. Then you have traditional private clouds, that is with uh, proper cloud management platforms, and you have 2% uh, hybrid cloud and uh, uh, lots of software as a service and 8% in infrastructure as a service. This means that basically everyone in the market is an idiot. <laughs> but there are lots of other idiots. This is from uh, Forrester. Uh, they are very well paid idiots. And they do surveys about the cloud and so on. And I ask it, can you send me please one of your $9,000 reports for free so I can do some slides. And I'm very convincing, so they sent me one. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that infrastructure as a service is basically flat. So all these guys are idiots. They are not using infrastructure as a service. It is public cloud infrastructure as a service. So there must be something amiss. And this something is probably the, the assumption under which this wonderful economics of public cloud 
is probably not true for everything or every company. So I will start with this one. It's, uh, uh, if, I, uh, if I remember, it's something from Microsoft that, that tried to justify was why Azure was wonderful as a public cloud and so on. And basically, they use it, uh, the economic argument to say, when you are uh, tracking capacity, basically, you are doing classical way, you buy more servers. So in the moment the, those servers are deployed, you have more capacity. If your workload changes a lot, you have areas where you're underserved, and when you have too much capacity, you're basically wasting it. Which is a very compelling argument. Uh, it's one of the arguments that uh, usually is brought down by Netflix. Uh, actually, the, the, the example of the dead horse was uh, from the chief cloud architect of Netflix, that now is with Battery Ventures. And uh, these are taken from their slides. One of the things that he, he told me is actually it would have been impossible for Netflix to grow that fast without a public cloud. And if you can see the growth rate, it's incredible. They would have had problems in buying hardware at that rate. They are perfectly right. How many companies grow like Netflix? They are the exception. I asked it for data, and I discovered that basically the average of variation across all the industry in Europe is very small. And I discovered that the European Commission uh, asked for a report for CBR and say, let's imagine in a perfect world where you have a perfect uh, linear expenditure. So you, uh, an SME, for example, can add exactly as much res uh, IT infrastructure as needed. How much would be uh, an improvement for the economic productivity? 0.2. In under perfect assumption, perfect linearity, zero cost of acquisition, which is basically a rounding error. So the first reason and the most cited reason why the public cloud is perfect actually doesn't care outside of Netflix or a few other companies, very few of them. The other one is the public cloud is a commodity. And so economic theory say that when there is competition, and you have competition between Amazon and Google and Azure and lots of other companies. When you have competition, the price rapidly goes down because uh, in a perfect competitive market, they try to reduce uh, their, low, their internal advantage to match the price of the others. Actually, this, there is a problem with the first uh, assumption that comes from the economist. Uh, it's a problem because public cloud is not a commodity. And actually what they are trying to imply is that public cloud infrastructure as a service is a fungible good. Fungible goods in economy are goods that can be exchanged one with the other. So that where there is competition, for example, in coffee beans or in precious metals, you have competition, but the actual good is indistinguishable one with the other. In IT, it's not possible. You cannot take a VM and bring in any other cloud without bringing a lot of other services with it. In fact, the people at 451 Research sent me a wonderful uh, slide from one thing that they call the cloud price index, which is basically an approximation of an SME cost for an internal IT infrastructure, brought externally to uh, cloud, public cloud. And in one year, the cost decreased by 2%, which is basically in line with inflation. If you are willing to commit to three years contracts, you can get something like 12% savings, but you are actually paying for three years in advance, which is a little bit uh, not in line with the idea of, oh, I just take for the things that I need. Then, Public cloud has greater utilization rate. Uh, Jeff Barr, the chief cloud evangelist from Amazon, uh, made a wonderful blog post that say, we do have, uh, actually, public cloud do have incredible utilization rate because we do have lots of customers. We can push those customers more and more in our servers, you know, like something like in the subway. Uh, but actually, 
Amazon does not report this number, and in the next slide I will show why. But we do have the numbers from Google, which is on a comparable scale, and it's 30%, which is exactly the average for private clouds. The interesting thing is that I asked Amazon for the source of the data, and they say that utilization rates are private and secret data that they use for uh, all their pricing algorithms and so on, but they sent me the source for the number, which is a report for NRDC that didn't have tables, so I asked NRDC for the tables and the data, and they were very kind to send me this table and where the data comes from. If you go to the public cloud line, you see the worst case and the best case. And uh, uh, the Amazon guys assumed that the worst case was some uh, lonely, small public cloud or whatever, and the best practice, of course, was Amazon. Actually, it's the opposite. Amazon has between 7 and 12% utilization rate, according to Accenture. And the number, 70%, it's actually 68.5%, and comes from VMware. I sent them a, a, a mail asking for correcting the article, but they have not answered me. <laughs> Don't know why. What happens when you have a traditional workload, 24-7 servers, whatever you find inside of a small and medium company or, or something like this? Uh, I had a wonderful exchange with one of Simon Wardley's uh, friends, uh, and he told me this example. You, 100 physical server, uh, actually a little bit more, inside of a company, six VMs on top. Uh, four switches, two routers, two firewalls, uh, virtualizing with an open source uh, hypervisor, uh, two or three people for managing the hardware, including some uh, hardware swap costs and so on. The cost in doing it with uh, AVS, with on-demand pricing, so you pay one year in advance, is $1 million for three years. In doing it yourself, it's something like $2 million for three years. More than half of that is personal, actually. And my answer is, well, you basically choose the most costly approach for doing it. If I had to do have 100 physical servers, first of all, I will go to a hardware as a service provider. There are lots of companies in Europe that do this kind of thing by the month. And I ask it for 30 of among the biggest uh, physical servers they do have, MG128, so you get an idea of what the provider is. Uh, they gave me no discount because they told me that 30 servers are basically nothing for them. The three-year cost is one-fifth of AVS, including power, one gig gigabit of guaranteed networking for each machine, backups, maintenance, and hardware replacement. Actually, there is a reason why they thought like they do. It's not that they are idiots. It's the problem that they are, start, they are thinking in the wrong way. Look at the, uh, the highlighted lines there. Fewer servers will make the scale of running it prohibitively worse. Why? Because the assumption was that they were running OpenStack. Because the real cost is not hardware, is management of the things that run on top of that. The real cost is the 77% of work that is necessary to keep the lights on, managing and so on. And the real cost is trying to do too much, using a tool that is not appropriate for the job. And that's one of the biggest problems in the uh, open source world I see, is that basically everyone is trying to fit a single tool for doing everything. One of these tools is OpenStack, which is a beautiful product. Really, it's a from the technical point of view, it did have some, let's say, growth problem. Now it's very mature, it does have lots of features. They are trying to match every service offered by Amazon, because that's by design. It was designed 
to create large-scale infrastructures. And they are trying to make sure that you fit only in cloud infrastructure. If you go to the marketing material of OpenStack vendors, they say they are not a good choice for traditional virtualization, which means that inside of a company, you have OpenStack for new cloudy apps and a, a traditional virtualization infrastructure like VMware for traditional apps. The problem is this. OpenStack is a wonderful product designed to reach any kind of scale, which means that it must reach this kind of scale, 600 parameters for networking. They need most of them because at huge scale, they need to be able to tweak these parameters, but actually you don't need them. Because when you go to work, you don't use something like this. <laughs> in, uh, uh, they don't invite me anymore in OpenStack conference, and I don't know why. <laughs> but one of my questions were, are you sure that one size fits all is appropriate? And they told me, of course it's appropriate. You can find parking very easily with this. You just <laughs> crash the other cars. And that's why you have uh, uh, even comics that take fun at the internal complexity of OpenStack, or the fact that I take fun at the internal complexity of OpenStack. <laughs> Actually, I got this idea because I have a friend that do uh, his work as an OpenStack season mean, and he actually loves and enjoys his work, and he sends me email like, Ah, yesterday we do have the great Neutron to Nova migration, and I basically shot myself after four hours in trying to make VLANs work because nothing stopped, everything stopped working, and I feel like this. The problem is that in 2001, companies had hundreds of racks of servers. Management was an issue. Nowadays, the majority of companies have less than one rack. Half of, open, of all OpenStack installs have less than 100 cores. And two, one third of the, the storage is below 10 terabytes, and more than half is below 15 or 20 terabytes, which is fairly small. We do have uh, 20 terabytes there in, the, in our uh, portable cloud. And the problem there is that we still need some management. Uh, when Garner, which is another of those high-paid ex uh, experts, started telling people, especially uh, people in the private cloud market, that they needed to add more and more features for uh, adding management, they actually did it for a reason, because they understand that most of the cost of doing things is management. It's not the hardware, it's not the software. Well, a little bit in installing software, but the point is, do you really need this management to be integrated in your cloud platform? Because actually, most of it happens outside. If you don't need it, it does not, let's say, stay there taking spare space and taking complexity. You can use lots of external tools for doing this kind of automation, which is especially easy for Open Nebula, because Open Nebula is one-tenth the size of other platforms. It's extremely simple. Uh, for us, uh, it's an order of magnitude simpler to integrate our extension in Open Nebula than in anything else, because we try. Uh, there are a few tools that you can add on top of Open Nebula so that if you need this kind of management, they can help you. If you don't, you run with plain Open Nebula. One of these is a wonderful tool that was both by Red Hat and released as open source under the name Manage IQ, which is a compliance engine. Basically, it helps you collect all VMs on different hypervisors, and it allows to go inside and say, for example, please tell me uh, which uh, software is inside or tell me if Windows is updated or if this registry key is there. Not everyone will need it. 
If you don't need it, it's not there taking space from Open Nebula. If you need it, you fire it up. The idea is to extend functionality, not by having a big project with lots of sub-projects inside, but by having a modularity of components. They are composable. This is an infrastructure as a service platform. You don't need to have everything at the platform level. Another one is uh, a project I'm very happy with uh, presenting because it's made by friends a few kilometers from my home. Uh, it's called CMD Build. It started as an ITIL engine, which for some of you is uh, some sort of uh, bad word, but actually ITIL is a set of practices for managing services, for managing reliability and so on, and concatenation of hardware and services. Uh, it allows you to manage the hardware, the physical part, where is this uh, uh, box uh, or how is the service doing? Not the VM availability, the service. Is it working as expected or not? If you really need to clone the Amazon things, you can by adding more modules. This one is called Comcast. It's one of the many tools that add extensions. They are deployable as a VM and implement SQS and SNS. There are tens of these projects because actually people discover that using Amazon costs a little bit. This is a clone of Google App Engine. It's actually a, the result of a partnership with Google. It's totally compi compliant. So if you need to run some uh, Google Apps uh, application in your private cloud, you can use this. It's uh, totally open and this is my favorite. You don't need Ceph or Zwift to implement S3. This, for example, is from Rakuten in Japan, the biggest internet provider in Japan. It's called LeoFS. It's written in Erlang, so it's basically not reliable. It's a tank. It never goes down. Uh, in the next uh, beta, they have added uh, uh, erosion coding. It already has multi data center replication, no single point of view, no failure, no split brain condition, totally snapshotable. It's export S3 and NFS. And nobody knows about it, which is something that really, really, really makes me mad. And last slide, and sorry for taking more time than, than all allocated. If you actually look at why people have difficulties in using private clouds, it's actually in selecting the right approach, in designing the right private cloud. Because now there is something like every private cloud is made of uh, OpenStack and Zwift and this and that. That's not true. Think about your needs, how many nodes you have, how you will grow. And there are lots of other pieces that can be integrated on top of Open Nebula for something that's simpler, easier to manage, and rock solid. Thank you. <laughs> Any question? I hope not, because I think I've already still how many minutes from... We can take that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I killed everyone. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much.